Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, introducing a project that I'm involved in. On um, it's called Endangered Archaeology of the Middle East in North Africa. Now, this project uh, was something that um, I've got into in the last year. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about what the project is about in my talk today. And I'm going to talk about some of the damages and threats which face cultural heritage sites in the Middle East and North Africa. And then I'm mainly going to talk about the actual database that we're creating, a spatial database to record these types of cultural heritage sites across this very vast region. And I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the web interface platform that um, we're developing in order for information to be entered into this particular database. And then I'll finish with sort of saying where we're at at the moment. So this particular project was initiated um, just last year, um, based at Oxford University and Leicester University. It covers a very vast geographical time, uh, geographical area from Mauritania to Iran. So it's a very large geographical area that we're working in. And we're primarily using uh, remote sensing data and satellite imagery to record previously unknown and known archaeological sites, and then to carry out condition assessments recording damage to these sites and also, importantly, threats to these sites. And we're also tapping into um, other databases of um, excavation work that's taken place across this area and excavation survey reports. But very importantly, we're working with local antiquities departments right across the region. We're engaging with them in different countries, introducing our database to them and working out ways in which we can um, work together in partnerships. So we comprise a team of about 10 people based in an office in Oxford. And over the last year, we've been um, recording like a vast amount of data um, and new archaeological sites and heritage sites across this particular region, building on, as I say here, existing knowledge. So there are really kind of three broad types of damages and threats uh, which sites across the Middle East and North Africa are exposed to. And the first kind of broad category I'm going to mention here is, is to do with conflict and looting. Obviously, there's a lot um, in the news with um, ISIS about this, about destroying ancient monuments. So it's critical in a way that we, we record these sites before they um, are subject to um, destruction from um, warfare, and from um, conflict, from explosions occurring on particular sites, vandalism, and looting as well of, of sites in areas where governance is very low, such as a moment in Libya, and in, obviously in, um, in parts of Syria at the moment, in Iraq, and Yemen is also um, another country where things are difficult at the moment with cultural heritage. So here's an example um, of what we, what we do. Here's a, some satellite imagery, some legacy satellite imagery, and some modern satellite imagery of the Al Qahira Citadel in Yemen. So you see the four different images in the top, in the top left. This satellite imagery was um, from 2003, showing uh, this, this particular citadel, which actually underwent restoration in 2006. And then you see in 2014, in this particular one, the citadel has been restored, or certainly um, significantly modified. But only last year, as part of the um, bombing campaign that went, took place in Yemen, this bottom right picture shows significant damage to this particular monument. So by looking at satellite imagery and, and um, aerial photographs, we're able to look and understand about the condition and state of cultural heritage sites across the region, with this being one particular example to do with conflict. And another example, of course, I could mention many. This is of um, an ancient city called Hatra in Iraq, which in March last year was um, ISIS actually uh, went in and demolished. And of course, we don't know the extent of um, what happened there because that's still under, under their control. But if we look at satellite imagery, you see here, this is an image from the 1930s. One of the things we're using is ancient Oh, not ancient, but like very old photographs from um, many years ago, showing the site extent there. 
And you see, up until as recently as April, um, just prior to the um, destruction, it's quite an intact area. The citadel located in here, in Hatra. But then um, we're working with colleagues at a company called Catapult Limited, looking at um, image, um, satellite imagery and looking at multispectral images. And this is of um, subsequent to the development. You can see what you see in green here is evidence of recent um, gypsum disturbance of the ground um, recorded in satellite imagery. And you can see that they've gone in and done a lot of damage in the particular area. So, so really, construction, or rather, um, conflict and uh, is causing significant destruction and there's um, the potential to, cons to, um, to do more. But it's not just, it's not just um, warfare, but one of the major developments is essentially construction. And this happens in all countries, of course, when there's increased construction and development. And here, there's some examples which we also mention on our website in more detail, such as um, road projects and dam development, and you know, major construction areas, mining and quarrying, pipelines, earth moving. All of these have significant impacts on cultural heritage sites in the Middle East. And whereas in Europe we have well-established practices for um, essentially preventing the destruction of ancient monuments across the Middle East, it's not quite as, um, in North Africa, it's not quite as clear as that. So we're hoping to provide baseline data to help cultural heritage organizations in this particular region. And here's a couple of examples. This is in um, Jufra in Libya. You see on the left-hand image here, um, satellite imagery here showing an ancient settlement. And then on the right, you can see that it's been significantly modified only in the last 15 years ago, and has been lost a lot of that particular settlement. And there's another example in Azraq in, in the Middle East. This particular image is an ancient, is an old satellite image across the ancient area of, the, of this particular citadel. And you can see the town encroaching. If we take off that ancient image, you can see that it's still intact, but the surrounding landscape has certainly been significantly um, impeded on. And certainly we want to be involved in helping to prevent these type of activities occurring again. And the last kind of broad category is to do with agriculture and also erosion. So there's lots of um, ploughing and irrigation canals and this um, pivot agriculture, these kind of circle areas in the, in the desert where they mine, where they dig, dig deep down for water to come up to the surface. And as well as that, there's terracing and also orchards. And this image here gives an example of an orchard that's um, encroached seriously on an archaeological site in Jordan. So that's the backdrop really, and there's a whole interesting talk on all of that aspect of itself, but I'm going to go into a bit more details of the database that we're constructing to help manage this particular data. And that's kind of the second part of the um, talk here now. And we decided, in uh, bearing in mind the project only started last year, we decided to use Arches heritage management software. Some of you may be familiar with this already, and I have some brochures as well I can hand out to anyone who's interested further. And also, um, there's actually a presentation on their website saying that um, Annabelle is speaking on Friday, who's up here in the audience, that's great, um, about Archer, so she can tell you a lot more about the actual database itself. But I'm going to go into it briefly and look at some of the modifications that we've been doing, because it's an open source software and it's designed to be modified to suit your project needs. And Arches itself actually had its history, had its origins, version one, in the Middle East, in Jordan. So, in a way, this software has been around, but it's, the version that we're using, version three, is substantially modified from version one. But its um, history lies in the Middle East and Africa too. Now, Arches, uh, I just noticed, was Christian's talk as well, has Postgres, um, QL, and PostGIS. And underneath is the underlying infrastructure. And it's the same with, with Arches. It uses the Django framework as well. And it also um, comes with a, a heritage inventory package, which is kind of a essentially a guide for you. Um, and maybe 90% of Arches projects just use this particular package and you, and you get on with your projects. 
you don't make any changes to it because it's a very good package to suit broadly different heritage projects. But you have the option to customize it. So I'm going to show you how we've customized this package today and show you some of the forms that have been generated as a result. So this is how our front end currently looks of the database. And um, there are sort of four steps that are involved broadly in creating our database. So the first one then from customizing the HIP, the historic inventory package, is to modify what are known as resource graphs. And Annabelle will talk about this, I'm sure. These are the underlying, <coughs> underlying kind of structure of Arches databases. And there are different types of resource graphs. And on this particular page here, if they mention um, six of them here broadly, so these are kind of categories of recording different types of heritage resources. So you have sites, heritage resource sites, and you have maybe you have um, features or, um, or objects. There's another category or activities. You can record activities that took place in the past and events that took place in the past. And also information resources, you kind of metadata. Each of these has its own um, sort of resource graphs associated with them in which they show the structure of the database. And all of these use, implement um, the CDOC CRM manual as well, which is very, very interesting. Um, and a lot of the work that we're doing is involved in this number called the E27, for those of you who are familiar with the CDOC CRM, which is defined here as a, um, a piece of land or sea floor. So we're, we're looking at using heritage resources, mapping them, and this is what we primarily use, although we can use all those other categories as well. So we're using the E27 primarily for our database work. It's recording a heritage place, a place that has a, um, an area which could be as big as this room or it could be as big as the ancient citadel of Aleppo. Scale isn't the problem, it's just deciding um, what we mean by the site. So there's also E18s, but I won't go into that for the moment. So what does a database look like then, in terms of its design and structure? Well, it comprises a list of um, nodes, they're called. And um, these are, sort of, some of them, I've extracted some of them here, and these are to do with a um, threat. Um, so the two I've highlighted here are known as threat type and threat type authority document. And if you read across this line of 458, it says threat type E55, condition assessment, and then it says domain, and that means it has a drop-down menu. So you're saying, what do you want to um, record in this particular attribute? And it's a drop-down menu, and that drop-down menu is known as an authority document, which is in the um, next web box. So these are two separate nodes. And then when you look down at the lower box here, this says source and target. This is like a parent and child relationship, showing how one is linked to the other. So it's saying that 461 is linked to 458. And then you can visualize this much more easily than looking at, looking at kind of boring tables, but you can see in a, as a network graph, as a resource graph, this is what we mean about the graph design. So there's threat type and threat type authority document. So it's saying for the threat type node, a, um, a list of semantic vocabulary can be selected and dropped down to go on there. So that's one part of this particular database structure. Now if I zoom out of that, you can see that that branch forms part of another branch. And this big branch on the left is known as a condition assessment. So there's everything to do with looking at disturbances and threats, date of assessment, broad kind of category called condition assessment. And when you look on the right, the graph on the right is the entire graph for our E27 um, heritage resource. So that means for every archaeological site, every heritage site, you can potentially fill in lots of different fields and they're all linked together. So it's a visual way of showing your, the way your database is designed. It's a very cool way to look at, look at the database and understand it conceptually, how it all links together. And those authority documents I mentioned, this is what I mean by an authority document. It's a list of types of, like a drop-down menu of types of um, threats. And that goes into the database, which you can then select these objects in the database um, for your, when you're filling out your form. So that's the, that's the kind of the second step is the authority documents. And the third step is actually loading data into the database. And this can be done um, by 
essentially looking at legacy data, but also what the project has been doing is using Google Earth imagery and we've been putting pins on maps. So we haven't been recording that much in the way of um, detail uh, initially in the database because we're going to use the data, we can use, we use the web interface to enter the data more thoroughly, but we just record a very few amount of points such as the coordinates of a site and a country, and those then uploaded into the database. And there you have a map showing and um, arches all of our sites across the, the region, of which we have 94,000 odd at the moment, with pins from Google Earth in them across 10 countries. And then the team are then entering information into the, um, the web forms. So I'm just going to show you now some of the forms. I don't expect you to read them all, obviously. We've only got a couple of minutes left. But I just want you to see some of the forms and some of the um, sort of what the team has to be entering into at the moment. So this is our web-based um, platform. So if you click on um, this button here, our heritage resource, up pops a form which is like a summary form. And here you see we're recording an ID number, any types of names, the broader site function of a site, and its kind of overall morphology, its site shape, the certainty of it being a site. We incorporated certainty after much discussion because we wanted to have an option for someone to say it definitely is a site or maybe a site. Cultural period, this is another drop down menu. This one is a known example, but we've got like 300 old cultural periods linked across different spatial areas. And we can have time span and then the assessment um, person who's done it. So immediately the team were reporting some very overall date information about the site. And then we record the location. So the location pane shows a map, which here is Google, um, uh, which rather is Bing map imagery base. But we can put our own satellite imagery maps, we're all collecting, we can georeference them, we can put them on as base maps. And then we can record additional information about the, the certainty of the location, the certainty of the size of the geometry, and that's where the country and the topographic setting. So we record this information in the location pane. And then we'll be describing the actual form of the database, of the form of the data, the cultural heritage site that we're looking at. What is it? What type of site is it? Or what, what type of form is it, essentially? What type of evidence is there? How many sites are there in that particular area? How are they arranged? So we get into that information and, and then we enter in a um, information about the interpretation. We're making interpretation of the data as well. So we have form and interpretation of separate parts of the database. And then that, that condition assessment that I showed you, that network graph on the left, this is almost a visualization of, of that's a visualization of these, this particular form. So we enter in the information um, to do with this condition state, disturbance extent, and also um, threat types, which is the one that I showed you. The example here is in the actual, um, initially, there's threat type recorded. So the information gets recorded in the database through these forms, which are customized from the Archer's forms that come with the, um, the Heritage Inventory Package. And a very powerful um, tool as well is the information resource graph. So all of the different satellite imagery maps we have, we can record them in the information resource graph, and we record bibliographical data and imagery data in those particular graphs. So we have all the data recorded and all the metadata recorded, all in the same, um, the same database. There's more information with the imagery panes. And when all that information is in the database together, Archer uses a thing called Elasticsearch, which is a very powerful search engine uh, which a lot of the major kind of large organizations use. And the search engine is very clever because you can search any of those nodes that you saw before. We can, we can search those nodes. So I can type in for a country like Syria, so we can search the country of Syria, and then I can search for a feature evidence type, which is small mounds of cairns. And then it produces a map, a spatial map showing where all those are. And then we can zoom in on the map and we can reduce the um, size of the map, zoom in and, and list only those that are in the map view. 
and there they come up. These are the numbers of the two sites there. So our search results then, we can, we can search in all manner of ways, all different types. You can search for Roman forts across the Middle East and North Africa, and then you can, you can search for Roman forts, just Libya and so on. So there's all sorts of ways of the, um, working with this data, which is very, very useful for research on the heritage point of view. And then a very important pane, a very important panel is known as related resources. So any of those resources can be related to any other resource using this particular pane. So this is very important, you can link a map to a site, you can link one Roman fort to another Roman fort. If there's any relationship you want to find between any node in, in the database, you can define them in this particular panel. And then there's an output report that can be produced, which we're working in progress at the moment on, because the one that comes with the HIP is not um, suitable for our needs, so we need to modify that. And this is what the user will see at the other end. What you see at the moment at the back end of the database, this is what the user will see, an output report listing this particular information. So where we are after a year is, um, it's been a, it's been a, a lot of time has been involved in, as you can imagine, conceptualizing what do you want to actually go and design in the database. Because you're looking at different countries, they have different things with different names for different sites and so on. A lot of the time has been gone to that. And then incorporating the um, Arches software, customizing that. And we have had some issues along the way with Arches version 3. And um, we talked to the Arches team, and then they take that feedback back. And then Arches version 4 is coming out. And these are going to be, um, become part of Arches version 4. So they're very, very good for listening for um, what needs to be changed and so forth. So that's in terms of databases, very promising. But we're also, in the last year, we've been building partnerships with um, different local antiquity authorities. We've been doing a training scheme recently in Leicester with antiquities um, people from Libya. And um, there's a whole, we haven't launched the database live yet because there's a whole sort of world of permissions which is kind of complex, and this will become as part of version 4 in Arches, um, which will help with being able to give different people different levels of access to the database. Because mm -hmm. obviously there's a lot of information there which could be sensitive. So we're continuing to re-enter records, and we're very happy with um, how Arches is working out for us so far as a tool for visualizing cultural heritage data across the Middle East and North Africa. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Any questions?